year. What do our schools need? Well, here to answer that from PS165 in District 3 is Christine Millett Dillett. I am an educator, a teacher. I'm also a parent of a student who um, is no longer in the system because she's in college now, but um, let me tell you the story. When I began teaching at PS165 in 2001, I already knew about the campaign for fiscal equity because my daughter had been in the public school system for two years. As a parent, I was outraged that my child was being shortchanged in her education simply because she went to school in New York City. In her kindergarten year, I spearheaded a year of fundraising and with many other dedicated parents from her school, increased donations from $10,000 to the previous year to $50,000. We decided that money was best used to hire aides to work part-time in all the classrooms. And while my daughter is now in college, parents continue to fundraise and pay for aides in the classroom at her elementary school, PS 166, the Richard Rogers School. We could have used that money to fund enrichment programs, but instead we believed it was in the children's best interest to provide more support inside the classroom. Classroom support that should have been funded by uh, the state. Instead of using the funds to enrich children's education, we were making up a shortfall from the state. We did it because we cared and we could. Today, the Richard Rogers School is owed $1.6 million, and it is long overdue. But what about the schools where parents can't raise fifty dollars or $100,000 every year? I'll tell you what happens, because I work at just such a school. First, you lose your reading recovery teacher. That's right. <laughs> then you lose your librarian. Next, your large, brightly lit library is shrunk to a tiny room with one window in which no more than six children can fit to browse for books. And it is staffed by an unpaid volunteer, a lifelong teacher from PS 165, now retired. The book collection is gutted. PS 165, the Robert E. Simon School, is owed over $2 million. What would we do with that money? First, we would hire a reading teacher then an intervention teacher for students at risk. Next, get our library back. And my personal favorite, enrich all children's education by building a science garden on the roof of our auditorium so that children can engage in long-term study of the natural and physical world. So I say this to you, Governor Cuomo. Pay our children the money to do them, and when this wrong has been righted, never ever let this happen again. And yet they could sit across from any table 
and be equally matched to any student in the entire United States. The year I left the Bronx, that program stopped. It's done. I now am in a district that has a really strong PTA. And yet as chaplain leader of my school, I sit in budget meetings at the end of the year and then just terrified by the fact that we don't make decisions based upon what's best for our kids. We make decisions based upon what we can afford. I refuse to acknowledge Cuomo's statement that we are failing. Teachers are not failing, it's the budget that is failing us. <laughs> hearing directly from the ones who are the most affected, students. Let me introduce Marcus Arthur, student from Talent Unlimited High School. The time has come for New York State to fulfill its promise. Fund our schools. Cuomo, you say cut back. We you say, say cut back. back. You say cut back. We <laughs> say cut back. There's another question. Raising the charter cap to allow well, up to 250 more charter schools in New York, not geographic anymore. To discuss this, we have the CEC3 president, parent, Noah Gottman. My parent voice. <laughs> um, one of the cornerstones of this absurd uh, educational plan by the governor, apart from the funding cuts, apart from the testing, is raising the charter cap. Seems innocuous enough, right? Why not give more opportunity and choice? The reason is, is because raising the charter cap undermines our public school. It undermines the 97% of the kids who are going to public schools in New York State. How does it do that? Why are we raising the charter cap when there is no accountability on the charts right now? charters in New York State. And yet the only audit that's been done by the state controller showed that 57 out of 60 charters that he looked at are either mismanaged or have fraud. Whoa. A recent study showed $58 million in just graft in the charter schools. We know it goes beyond that. The makeup of the students. It's got to be audited. It's got to be looked at. It's the law. They are not educating the same kids as our public schools are. about what the real damage I see 
the charter, the charter cap. And that is that it's taking the governor's eye and the legislator's eye off of the 97% of the kids. 29 out of 30 kids are in public schools. And yet, the proposal is to provide choice through the charter. They're not moving the needle. They're not changing the education system. And they're allowing our governor to say, I'm doing all I can. Well, governor, we know you're not. What you need to be doing is saying, stop the charter cap. Stop focusing on the 3%. And focus on the 97%. Yes. And what we have to do as parents, as teachers, we're not getting our numbers out. We are not being shown. We are the 99%. We are the 97%. And yet, Eva Moskowitz, by closing her schools and getting the hedge fund funding, is able, able to, to, to make this myth that somehow they have this demand, and somehow they have this choice, and somehow. But it's not true. We are 2.7 million children. They are 100,000. We are 3 million parents. They are 100,000. 29 out of 30 kids are in public school. But we have to go out. We have to do our part. Parents, the UFT is doing it. The UFT is doing it. On March 12th, we're going to have a rally around our schools to protect our public schools. And on March 28th, we are going to have a citywide rally to protect and save our public schools. We need to have thousands of parents there. We need to have thousands of teachers there. We need to have thousands of community members, principals. Because we have to show the governor that 8 million public school parents, community members, are stronger than 40 hedge funders who are funding him and Eva Moskowitz and parents for another uh, school. Our next speaker is from Washington Irving High School, a teacher, my friend and colleague, Great one, Doug. All right. I'll talk about other topics I've been all day, so my voice may be a little bit worn out, but I'm going to try. Uh, I'm a teacher at Washington Irving High School, thank you, and I'm um, a chapter leader, and we've been through this co-location, and we understand what happens. First of all, the previous administration purposefully sent us uh, students who were living in other countries who didn't even show up to show that our numbers were so bad, we needed to be co-located. So there, you know, as soon as you lift that cap, they got to find space, and they're going to find space in places where uh, high-need students are uh, being educated, and we cannot let these people down. First day, um, Eva Moskowitz's uh, uh, school came in. I was trying to find the bathroom. Uh, because they kind of replaced our bathroom. And we walked in uh, to their floor, and I was immediately told or asked, are you lost? I said, I have been in this school for 25 years. I said, who are you? She said, I am uh, the public affairs advocate for success charter schools. I said, well, that's a really great way to spend money, taxpayer money. We have seen all sorts of things. Kids eat fresh direct. There's nothing wrong with that, except for our kids do not eat fresh direct food. And our kids see the fresh direct food. Our kids see um, all of the new furniture. They see everything, right? And so what happens if there I get you if, if there is a student who misbehaves, uh, they take them outside. They sit them on a park bench. They said, you're not going to come back in until you misbehave. Well, I'm here to tell you, we need to educate all of New York City students. And we can't, as public schools, say, you can't come in until you misbehave. I say, you cannot 
solve a problem by the, the entity that is causing the problem. The problem is inequality. We need to have equality throughout all of our schools. And you can't buy that. And Governor Cuomo, you can't sell our public schools out. What do you want? Equity. What do we want it? Now! The next question is, what impact co-locations has had on our schools? Effect on students, space, lower enrollment in district, and whatever else. So, first speaker is Teresa Marte from PS234 in District 3. charter schools invade our school. Um, mid, um, opportunity charter school at the middle school level and opportunity charter school at the high school level and also that's Academy 4. Um, when I first started working in my building about 12 years ago, we had a population of 900 students. We filled the whole building three floors. And um, as soon as the charter schools invaded our school, Within a period of five years, we went from 900 students to less than 100. We only filled one floor now, half of the floor. And I just want to talk about the population of students that we have currently. Um, we have a very high population of ELL, English language learners, and special needs students, IEPs. Um, many of our students have either transferred from saying it nicely, transferred, but they've been counseled out or sent out of the success chain. Or our students have tried to apply and weren't accepted. So the students that have come to our schools after being transferred, they didn't come in September, they weren't welcomed in the, in the beginning with everyone else. They came after October, once their budget was set, or right before testing. That's when they come to us. And when they come to us, these are children who are very needy and they feel rejected. And they are our most challenging students. But we don't say, you can't be here. We stay with them for the, you mean, for the, oh, sorry, for the whole year. I got to wrap it up. But I witnessed the damaging effects of just um, counseling out students and sending them to our schools. Um, another point I wanted to make was the displacement. One year, our kindergarten and first graders, they were pushed down to the basement next to the boiler room because we needed to accommodate the Success Academy students. We tried to fight that, but we were told, you just don't have the numbers. Um, okay, also the tension, I want to talk about the tension that is created. Um, from the first day that Success Academy invaded our school, we had teachers, their teachers at every entry point, standing, manning um, their side, just to let us know that you can't cross here. To our students, or parents, or teachers. <coughs> Yet, they do freely come to our side when, at their community have to, but we don't shut them out. We just look at them. The tension is evident. And um, I just wanted to say to wrap it up, if you're going to praise charter schools and blame public schools for the problems that they're experiencing, level the playing, the playing field. You can't compare the two. qualify 
for what they call true education to go to college and graduate. Now, recently we just took an English exam and we had to uh, make a critical lens essay and all of this. But what we don't, what they don't tell us is that the books they give us to take these exams are ripped apart, barely, we have to tape them together. My book, uh, The Great Gatsby, was in pieces. I mean, literal pieces. But they're not going to tell us that. And but you see, we're able to pass and continue to graduate because of the great and dedicated teachers we have. Yeah. And see, but it's, it's, these teachers are very talented. We have great teachers, but it's a shame that we have to put them through this. Yeah. Teachers staying after school, using their money right. or what they should be given to print out papers and worksheets and get proper supplies to teach That's the right. students. But I do commend them. I commend them very well for teaching us to do what they have to do, despite what they are giving them. And as I wrap it up, I would just like to say that as a student of the Board of Education, I am truly grateful to each and every teacher. Each and every teacher. Each and every teacher. And if you believe, as many of my colleagues and other students believe, that this is not right, so let's stand up and let's stand up and try, try, work together, try to make a change. But what we believe in. So if you're with me, can I get some applause? Can I get some applause? Silently, without language, without words, but 
they are not as good as their counterparts at Harlem's success. They learn silently without words that some children are more deserving than others. Some children deserve the newest and brightest equipment. Some children deserve none at all. Some children deserve music programs, others do not. Some children deserve block rooms and others to be taught in hallways and stairwells. Some children deserve fresh food delivered daily and others the lesser fare of the DOE. If you are looking for a perverse negation of Brown versus Board of Education, please come to PS 149. Whoa. Each day I see these uh, groups of students moving through the hallways and stairways of 149 where children from the same neighborhood walk with no human recognition of each other. While their ephemeral teachers and staff uh, behave as if I and my colleagues were not even there, snapping their fingers and barking out orders, this too is an education. There is something wrong here. It is morally wrong, civically wrong, and spiritually wrong. Mm. Such cruel disparity has no place at all in a democratic society. Right. And such an education has no place in our city and in our nation. Thank yes. you. What they do, life is still good. Thank you, Sonia. I'm here to discuss my children, not only my children, but Mickey Mill and 11th District 75 children. Like Patrick said, our children are speechless, but I'm a voice for the voices. I am so tired of my Mickey Mill's children getting off the school bus on 118th Street and they walk all the way around to 117th Street on the second floor in the back. That's where they go to class. Now, these children have a special needs. So when they're walking through the hallway, mind you, they have to walk through PS149, MS149, Harlem Gyms, and Harlem Success Academy. Oh no, don't have therapy. You gotta kick the ball, get your occupational therapy. Everybody gotta move to the side. This is not fair, this is not right. Now you don't wanna discuss PS, MS149, where our school looked like a penthouse, I mean a, a prison, and their school looked like a penthouse, right. okay? Right. Our bathrooms right. have fallen tiles, okay? We, uh, when our bathrooms are broken, we can't use how to set bathroom. Oh no, we must go all the way around the corner. This is not fair, this is not right. Special needs children, supposed to have an education seat, I'm not even a parent of Mickey Man with 11. My child go to 149, but I care about all the children. You tell our children to dream. You tell our children to dream. I look at their faces every day. It's becoming a nightmare. One of my third grade students say, Miss Sonia, I'd rather just go to jail. Why? Because he's tired of studying for a test. We need help, and we need it now. We are tired of evil Markowitz. We are tired of this whole money to boom. Like Patty said, come to 149 and I'll show you our prison house and I'll show you their penthouse. All right. That was CTA president from PS149 in District 3. Uh, today we're hearing a lot about um, inequality, but we, we demand equity. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! When do we want? Every! When do we want it? Now! Testing. Testing and more, more testing. And now the governor wants to, to tie the, to tie to teacher evaluations. To discuss this, we have a speaker from PS242 in District 3, Marisol Della Cruz. Okay, we have Jessica Harvey from PS3 in District 2. Test, test, test. Yeah. Testing. 
Testing. Testing. Governor Cuomo has embedded major changes to the teacher evaluation process in his proposed state budget. From this teacher's perspective, the changes his budget could bring to public schools could bring the profession of teaching to its knees. Educators want to be held accountable. However, we know that tying state testing of students to teacher evaluations is an irresponsible and inaccurate, that's irresponsible and inaccurate, misuse of data. The American Statistical Association states that value-added measures typically measure correlation, not causation. Effects, positive or negative, attributed to a teacher may actually be caused by other factors not captured by the model. Aspects of educational effectiveness that are measurable and within teacher control is only a very small part of the variation in student test scores. So what does make a difference? Poverty. Yeah. High stakes testing based evaluations will increase pressure on teachers to teach in ways they know will be counterproductive and may be damaging to students, especially students in poverty, especially students with IEPs, especially English language learners. Schools will be forced to narrow their curriculums, favoring tested subjects over the arts, sciences, music, physical education. I am afraid the school library I teach in could even be closed due to lack of attention and funding in this area. Finland's teachers, recognized globally for educational system excellence, are evaluated by locally determined measures, not test scores. In comparison, most teachers in the US don't even teach tested subjects, yet they get annual grades best based on student yearly test scores. We want to be evaluated fairly by real experts on the things that actually matter to student learning. High stakes standardized testing tied to teacher evaluation does not work and it damages real student outcomes. church because I gotta believe that we are going together. Together we can make this better. I have faith that we are going to make this better. Can I get an amen? Amen! amen. All right, she knows how to speak now. So I'm gonna be a little bit personal here because I'm a parent with two students. They went through public schools in District 2 and still in a District 2 school. I have been fortunate. I've had such wonderful teachers in both of my daughter's classes. Why were they wonderful? Because they taught my kids to be creative. They taught them to be curious. They taught, taught them to ask the right kind of questions. They taught them to think critically. And they taught them to be compassionate, kind people. And they also taught them how to solve problems. Not math problems, not fill in the blank problems, but problems dealing with difficult situations, interpersonal skills. Now, are these the things that are being put on the ELA and math tests? No. no. Why on earth would I want my wonderful teachers evaluated on Pearson produced test industry training? Thank you. at filling in the bubbles. I object to this deeply and personally. My children's teachers were wonderful not because they taught them how to take tests, because they taught them to be responsible, compassionate citizens of the future. And I want my teachers evaluated, of course. I'm not saying no evaluation for my teachers, but evaluate them on things that are important to me, to my children, to society. Yes. What are we doing if we're telling teachers that the only thing you have to do is teach my kids how to take tests in math and English? Where are we gonna be 50 years from now? Mm. Who is gonna be running the country when people who run the country, the only thing they know is to take these stupid standardized tests? Woo! So I implore you. about 
as a nation. Thank you very much. We have a governor that seems to want to punish schools rather than support schools. Rather than building up low-performing schools, he wants to shut them down. Um, to speak on this subject, we have a parent from Wadley Secondary uh, School, Lisa Presley. Donna Marie Fasina, my friend and colleague from PS15 in District 1. It's a renewal show. fight up in Albany, these are the, these are the people who are going to be, be supporting us. We've got Ben Kalos. Can we hear it for Ben Kalos? Civic 
Hall, which is a new place on the 20th and 5th Avenue, uh, 4.30 on school folks, CDT folks, and technologists to try to figure out how to deal with all the many issues. They're long and too complicated here. But every time I meet with principals or teachers or DOE, DOE officials, we just have to get it right and sort of think of a way to be 22nd century and not 21st or even earlier. So that's one issue that we're working on. Um, we're also very concerned, as you are, about the quality of I say quality mental health, some place for young people, teachers, and parents to go to in the school to talk about issues, because so you are so, the teachers are swamped, the counselors are swamped, and we need other kinds of support in the schools. I have 35 foster care kids, so I'm somewhat familiar with kids who have challenges, and the fact of the matter is that kind of discussion is incredibly helpful. Um, we're also obviously very concerned about the arts, as you are. You do, you, you, you think about it at the CEC, you think about it as parents, you think about it because it's so important. The mayor has put money into the uh, middle schools, but we're really trying to even make it more um, universal in the schools. And I know that um, in Manhattan in particular, I know there are other boroughs, I've heard of them, but I'm very particular to Manhattan. And the issue is to try to, with all the cultural opportunities here in Manhattan, there's no reason that there can't be even more that's of assistance to the schools. And then just um, finally, I think that the way in which um, we can be helpful as, a, as borough president is to obviously work on the capital side with the city council. We work with the council members, allocating every possible penny of capital money into the schools. We'd love to hear from the CDCs as to what you think are the priorities for your district. We've met with the superintendents, all of them from Manhattan. We've met with some CDC members. We're following up on um, all the blue book issues that I know many of you have been looked at, how that fits into what's needed in a school. There are many, many ways you can look at capital dollars. Um, I know time is of the essence, but those are just some of the issues that we're working on. And uh, we're very accessible, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and thank you for holding my coat. <laughs>
and I was expecting kids to ask me questions like, what was your least favorite course? And of course, the question they asked is, uh, what do you want to do for seniors in your district? These are the kids that we're talking about, and they are our future. Uh, and uh, while I'm at it, I just want to mention that I, I have the most talented kids in my district, Talents Unlimited. They participated in my inauguration, my state of the district. Can we just give them a quick round of applause? Thank you all for coming out today. I'm going to pass it on to, the, uh, to Assembly Member Dan Court, with whom I uh, 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 with whom I share the Upper East Side. Uh, but thank you all for coming out, and please make sure to tell Albany and support our legislators. Uh, we need to bring as many dollars back to New York City. We need the campaign for fiscal equity to be respected, and we need to invest in our children. Yeah. I think we should just give one more round of applause yes. to our yes. members. And, um, speakers, and uh, I just have to say you know, a few words. If we have here our borough rep, and I just, we should give them a real big hand. every day to connect for us in all of <coughs> We've got to make sure that we're, we've got their backs. Yes. We're going to support them. That's so right. who's here to support them? We are. Yeah. We are. Okay. Nobody forgets. So we have State Senator Dan Ford. Assembly member in the district uh, in and around here on the Upper East Side. Um, you know, I'm a, a wannabe history teacher. I never made it. My dad said, "Go to law school." He's sitting in the third row. Um, <laughs> Eighty? How many years? Eighty years uh, of teaching. Forty-one. Forty-one. Uh, taught in every borough in this city. greatest job I could have in the state legislature in Albany. Um, and really, but history as I know it is really the change of events over time. It's not dates and numbers and things. And for me about education, it's really about two things in my own life that I look at. And there are 25 years of gap between them. First is how I grew up with my parents. Uh, as educators, my mother taught at, I think, George Washington High School for a year or two. My father taught at JFK High School. He taught at all five boroughs. That's been throughout. What I learned is many lessons from my parents, but one specifically, that the idea that teachers work nine to three, that it is a nine-month, ten-month job, that weekends don't count, wasn't my life. As an adolescent growing up, none of that is true. And then I take it 20 years later. Now I have a second grader in PS5 27, four blocks away from here. I'm just another PTA dad sitting in the dump tank. Well, hopefully not sitting in the dump tank. But, and I learned what it is to interact with teachers. My wife is the PTA president to help these teachers. And what can be accomplished in a public school with a principal that knows what he or she is doing and with great teachers committed to their craft. And that, to me, is the most onerous thing about what the governor has suggested in all his policy directives, is that teaching is not a profession. That you can test, you can assert test scores based upon 50% or some number picked out of a hat, and that tells you if a teacher is good or bad, or if a child is learning or not. Everything I know in my life, or my own experience, suggests to me that that is in no way the truth. And that teachers, in difficult circumstances, in difficult districts, even here, are taking money out of their own pockets and their own children to give the children of their class something extra. Right. Um, and so, uh, of all the policy problems in this, to me, that is one of the worst. Um, this plan is really premised on two things. One, 
that the governor and his supporters will win some sort of PR award and that's some sort of PR policy thing. And I am very happy that to see so many people in this room here on a Friday afternoon because it suggests to me that's not going to be true. That's right. That The editorial boards may say whatever they say, and that Assemblymember Gottfried and I will get tired in May or June of not getting a paycheck, and that will fold. That's not going to happen. We're not going to fold. We're going to stand with you. We're going to fight. We're going to make sure that... We're make sure the privatization of what should be public schools will remain public. Thank you. Um, before I introduce the king of community learning schools, Dick Godfrey, I am going to just announce that we have Tony Hernandez, who is the principal and CSA rep of District 4, and he works for PS. MS 72 and he's brought his whole school leadership team to learn about what's going on. So this man, our last speaker, is the health committee chair and has decided that his cause was going to be community learning schools. He has given resources, dollars, everything, and he has connected us with hospitals for community learning schools. And he's here helping us on this fight. Do we have his back? Yes! Yeah. Yeah. Do we have his back? Yes! Yeah. Yeah.
some of our finest professionals who from 9 to 3 every day have nothing but a public schedule in front of, I mean, if you think politicians ever stand in front of a critical audience, the notion of standing in front of 30 school kids scares the daylights out of me. By the way, I don't know if Marcus is still here. I want to know whose assembly district he lives in so I can give them fair warning. <laughs> You want to keep Marcus on your side, let me tell you. This is about as critical an issue as we ever confront, fighting for school funding. You know, in 1963, in the I Have a Dream speech, we all remember Martin Luther King talking about having a dream. He started out talking about the unpaid promissory note mm, thank you. that America owes. Exactly. New York State has a multi-billion dollar unpaid judgment that it owes to our schools. That's what we're fighting for. That's what we're standing for. And I don't want to hear Governor Cuomo telling us that he's not going to fulfill that court order. He's not going to pay New York's debt to our kids unless we give in uh, to his personal agenda for how he thinks our schools ought to be run, he who day after day has no public schedule, we're going to fight for every dollar for our kids, and that's that. Thank you. We have representatives for Liz Krueger. We have a representative from Assemblyman Brian Kavanaugh, who's in Albany right now fighting for our dollars. And, and Brad Hoylman and, and Rebecca Seawright, who are right now fighting for our dollars. By the way, we have our district reps here, and they should be congratulated. Yay!